It's good again to see all my worship warriors back. As you can see, we have another discussion panel going on today. Back with us is Keith Gooseby, Yeshaya Ben Israel, and then Austin Crosby. Did I say that right, Yeshaya? Is that, is that the whole thing, Ben Israel? Okay. Yeah. So um, who would like to go first in kind of giving a brief overview of yourself? Who wants to go first? So Keith, go ahead and start with yourself if you we want to. We nominate please. Keith. Okay. Yes, I'll go first. All right. Go very, ahead. very happy to. My name is Keith Gooseby the um, second. I currently I, I, I just relocated from Texas, um, and my family and I now live in Maryland, about thirty minutes from Washington D.C. Uh, my wife and I, you know, we've got three three boys, uh, an almost twelve year old, four year old, and a two year old, and uh, we lead uh, Net Church. Uh, from from our home, and it's a, a church that started virtually and uh, and has grown to uh, become a community of people who uh, stretch across uh, the United States and even abroad. And and I'm here. Hey, nice. Okay, who's next? Austin, go ahead and introduce yourself, sir. <laughs> Look, he, he just volunteering people. He ain't gonna ask. He just say, yeah. you, you do that. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, greetings again. Uh, my name is Austin Crosby. I am a ordained minister with Firekeepers International. I'm also a rabbi, and I've served my um, my community and the surrounding areas and many other places as a spiritual advisor, deliverance minister, etc. for the past ten or so years. Um, and shoot, now my everything that I've done now has pretty much been virtual, especially for the past couple of years. Um, these past three years especially has been a lot as far as, you know, my own personal journey and healing and growing into my place with the most high and understanding, you know, my relationship with him as well as my relationship with others, healing my relationship with the body from past quote unquote church hurt, religious abuse and trauma and so forth. And my goal is to be able to help people through that, just like the creator helped me through that. So yeah, I am. <laughs> and you shot. Hey, um, I'm Yachaya Ben Yisrael. Um, I, whew, long story, but keep it short. Um, ultimately, the Mosai, he's uh, he's called me to to have an assembly um, in the future. Um, at the moment, I've been pretty much in the wilderness, um, really working on uh, myself, working on really figuring this thing out. Um, because the last thing I want to do is teach people the wrong thing, so I'm really cautious about that. Um, so, so ultimately, um, I'm, I'm really, really into fitness. Uh, the most I, he's given me a, a ministry when it comes to fitness. Um, and in that, uh, you know, uh, it says in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the thief comes not but to, to kill and to steal and to destroy. And I've come to give them life and life more abundantly. So ultimately, uh, I believe that a, a big area opportunity for the body of Messiah um, outside of spirituality is also uh, taking care of the temple that the most High gave us. So, um, so ultimately, um, between that and and studying the scriptures, uh, that's pretty much what I do. Awesome. So I was thinking uh, it would be really nice if we would also tell a few things to our viewers. Of, of course, this is up to you. Do you want to? Okay, perfect. Go ahead. Get started. <laughs> All right. So um, my name's Travis. Most of you know my wife. You might have seen her once or twice. So. <clears throat> A little bit of different backgrounds, but a lot of the same path as everybody here. We were raised in the church, uh, different denominations and, and different doctrines. And uh, as the Lord leads and opens up scripture, we come to different realizations and different paths. So now we're just struggling to see what does God really say? Mm -hmm. what's, what's the letter of the law? Where's the edge? What's the hedge that the church has put around it and different denominational doctrines? And where's the real freedom that should be preached through scripture and, and not the, the binding of chains of religious ideologies? So we may get into heretical ter uh, territory as we discuss this, because the line between righteous and damnation sometimes can be pretty thin. Mm -hmm. uh, and we want to be sure that we are guided by the Holy Spirit, looking for truth. And not just trying to find a reason to run off and sin and do what we want to do. So, yeah, true purpose is to follow God in its fullness, mm 
-hmm. right. line upon line, edge to edge, all dimensional, without overstepping our bounds, mm -hmm. all the way up to without crossing over. So I think we need to pray for Austin's computer because he seems to be a little possessed this morning. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> so since we're going to be talking about witchcraft today, I think we probably ought to start basking in the Holy Spirit and in the presence of Yah, that he, He'd be around us and feel us. May His angels encamp about us and protect us. Mm -hmm. May all the wiles of the enemy flee from here and be gone. Mm -hmm. Resist the devil and he will flee. We have power over the and dominions of this earth. Mm -hmm. The power has been bestowed upon us by Yeshua Messiah and the shedding of his blood. We proclaim power and grace and protection here and now. As we walk down this path of a very touchy subject, Lord God, we pray your spirit fill us and teach us. Open our eyes and open our ears that we may see and hear the good word of the spirit and judge rightly and be called good servants who have studied and showed themselves the fruit. We pray all this in the name of Yeshua Messiah. Amen. 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 Okay, so let me let me just. Did you want to say something, Yishai? I said amen. Oh, all right. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> he agrees. Good. Okay, so let me just state the questions, just like I did uh, in the last video. Um, so the so we got two questions again that we're going to focus on. First question is how do we define witchcraft, both by our own experiences and also by the biblical definition? So we're hoping to have scriptures and stuff that will back all that up. The second question is, what makes certain practices witchcraft? And I guess you could also put in there what makes certain practices not actually witchcraft. Um, examples would be, you know, the use of crystals, burning of sage, potions, divination, sorcery, necromancy, the drinking of blood, etc. So with that all in mind, who wants to start first? I want to do want to make Austin. You look like you was about to say something. Uh, actually, no, I wasn't. I was over here trying to argue with my computer a little further. <laughs> there, if you want, if you want to do some, put yourself on mute and do some deliveries. Go right ahead. Um, <laughs> yeah. I might just have to because child, this the this the exorcist in technology right here, Lord. Yes, sir. So. Since this is such a touchy situation uh, and scripture is very clear, I want to say up front that not everything brought up today may be an actual belief. This is a study of a topic, not a study of what we believe on the topic. We're looking for truth, and there will be things that will be probably heretical. We're going to be talking about different religion, religious practices. Um, and to take everything said today with a grain of salt and put against the word. Yes. Right. Yes. Don't come after anybody for anything we say today. But we may clarify where we stand. And we're going to, we're liable to hurt a lot of people's feelings. Yeah. Because a lot, some people don't believe um, in witchcraft. Some people believe everything is witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So with that said, we're going to be covering all the territory just to see what is and is not. And, see what scripture was so with that we'll get into the subject Go ahead. okay just another thing to kind of piggyback off of that if you're watching this video don't just take whatever we say as law scripture whatever go and look it up for yourself and also remember that your walk is not going to be the same as ours and so if, if some some of our viewers may have actually come out of the occult and so it might not be a really good idea to look into this right away if you've recently come out of the occult. You might want to just put that off to the side for a while after staying away from any of that stuff that you recognize as being a cult or witchcraft or whatnot, and then later revisit it when you feel more mature and ready to. That's just all I want to say. Okay. Now, we, now we've covered our backsides. Let's dig in. So the word witchcraft, best that I can tell, is really not in scripture. There are several Hebraic words translated as witchcraft. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we had to go through five or six different versions of the Bible to find these three verses that use the word witchcraft. And so the first one is going to be Exodus 22, 18. And it talks about not allowing a sorceress to live. Sometimes that word is witch. is translated as a witch. Yeah. Leviticus 19, 26. Do not eat any meat with the blood still in it and do not practice divination or witchcraft. And some versions have seek omens or sorcery. And then another one we wrote down is Leviticus 20, 27. A man or a woman who is a medium or a spiritist among you must be put to death. You are to stone them. Their blood will be on their heads. And these verses are kind of why we're digging into this today. Because what does that mean? What does it look like? Because there are things in scriptures that we've come across that look like it could be divination, i.e. the casting of lots, the umen and the thumen that the priest would use for getting words from God. Uh, some people have talked about the scroll used by the priest in the case of uh, an adulterous, the, the possibility of an adulterous wife, right? So there are things in scripture that some people re refer to as witchcraft, sorcery, and divination. But then scripture goes and condemns them to death. So we want to know what the line is. How do you define it? And what's it look like in your, script, in, in your world? Yeah. So um, regarding the first question, um, I just want to kind of talk about my own experience with witchcraft, which has really been only from the perspective of the church. And anytime it's ever been brought up, it's always been, oh, you can't do that. That's bad juju. Don't go there. Witchcraft. And it's always in the context of, uh, it's just blown way out of out of proportion. It, it's it's almost as if as if they're saying everything is witchcraft unless they define it as not being witchcraft. So um, honestly, I was under the shroud of confusion for a long time and just wouldn't touch certain things. I wouldn't even consider certain things. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even try and figure out what it was, especially with the scripture that's thrown out there so often that says something like. Um, you, you shall not even know their ways. So I can't even like know uh, cognitively what they do, if that makes any sense. So, um, you know, for a long time, I didn't, it didn't really matter to me. Like I wasn't curious about it at all. I don't even know if I would call it a curiosity today. However, um, in my experience, um, I got to a place where I was very frustrated because <clears throat> We had, we had become so separated in, in a sense where we couldn't even, uh, what is the word? We couldn't even have a conversation with somebody who practiced any kind of witchcraft or somebody who, who was a, a new ager or something. We couldn't even have a conversation with them. And, and I, I got frustrated with that because it's like, I would have all these questions in my head, like, well, how come I can't have a conversation with these people when these people when I, when all, everybody's telling me these people actually need what we have. And so I, I came to an understanding that, well, we're actually treating them like they're not human. If they don't believe that the way that we do, we're treating them like they're not, they're not actually human. And so then I started questioning also, not only that, but at the same time, um, the Lord was telling me things that were kind of rocking my world. Like one of them, for example, was um, he wanted me to stop being so ashamed of being native. So I'm native Hawaiian. If you don't know that already, I'm also Cherokee. I just don't know. I don't know anything Cherokee. I was raised Hawaiian. So I know all the ancient practices of my people. And um, so I had actually separated myself thanks to the church, uh, but also because of other circumstances from my own family as a result of that indoctrination. And um, 
a lot of the indoctrination in the church teaches you can't be native and follow Jesus. You can't have a relationship with Yeshua and be native at the same time. You have to put all of those practices away. So essentially, I wasn't allowed to practice hula. I wasn't allowed to use that as a form of worship to the God of gods, yod heh And um, I can't even tell you the suffering I went through as a result of that. And honestly, I didn't know it until the Lord started opening my eyes. And I started having all these questions then. Well, if you don't, if you want me to be native because you were the one who created me that way, then, then I really need to understand what actually is witchcraft, what is paganism and what's not. Because oftentimes those two, are, two words are used interchangeably. So that's, that's my experience with witchcraft and why I'm now like looking at all these different things. As far as the biblical definition goes, um, I'm finding out there is a really fine line between what's witchcraft, practicing witchcraft, and practicing, um, you, it, I'm probably going to really piss off a lot of people, but it's look, it, it's looking like to me, like there are things that you can do, um, the, the same kind of elements that people use in witchcraft, say, for example, sage, and we'll get into that later, you can actually use that while you, as, as a form of prayer to the God of the universe, which we would considers the god of the bible so i'm finding out there's a very fine line there um because when you look in the bible like we were just saying first of all that that word witchcraft is not necessarily in there um and so when we read through these scriptures and there's only a few of them the way that it is blown out of proportion in the churches is like why is it that there's only three scriptures that talk about not doing witchcraft but yet that's all they seem to talk about in the churches right so anyway those that's one of the questions and so when you look through the scriptures um it's really just talking about sorcery uh <sighs> seeking omens uh, we, we had a conversation earlier about what is seeking an omen like and so we looked through the interlinear area, I think, right? And then we'll I can't remember what else, but um, omens could be searching for a sign. Well, okay, but God created signs and seasons. So, so that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't, you can't believe in signs. Um, so it's very convoluted as far as that goes. I think I'll just leave it there. Did you want to say anything else? Nope. Guys, who wants to jump in? Yeah, I'll I'll jump in. So uh, similar to similar to you, Cowie, I uh, grew up in church with a, a very limited, uh, very limited definition. Um, in fact, witchcraft was not a word that was used so much as uh, sorcery. Um, I remember sp specifically some teachings on sorcery and the Greek word for sorcery is pharma, pharmacae, where we get the word pharmacy from. And so it has to do with doing drugs, um, which which sounded good enough for me to believe it uh, growing up and just kind of run with it, not necessarily teach it uh, because I haven't had much exposure or experience to it. Uh, and in a similar way, there are certain things that were just bad and they were always bad. So you, you can't, you know, can't, uh, can't let the kids participate with friends and, and get candy on on Halloween uh, because you know that's for for witches and, and ghouls and goblins and it's involved with witchcraft and if you have a cat make sure the cat is in the house all of these things uh, which as I grew older really seemed that uh, some of the the brand of Christianity that I had been taught, over time, I'm certain with well intentions, uh, was just a different version of the same superstition that that we were taught to avoid. Um, and and when we look through when I look through scripture uh, and compare it to things that are described or defined as as witchcraft, uh, like you said, Cowie, there are a number of things that are that are actual you know practices. Uh, that were ordained for for priests to to do, and there are sacraments uh, that that are practiced today uh, that come from the New Testament that uh, that could be 
seen if practiced by someone else, it might be called witchcraft. You know, they they burned incense in in the tabernacle and in the temple, and they lit candles, uh, and there there was blood sacrifice. Uh, one of the things that I recently uh, recently discovered is is that when the Israelites would go into battle carrying the Ark of the Covenant, that practice was, was, not, uh, was not one that was specific to Israel. Uh, many kingdoms and nations would carry something into battle that was representative of the God that they served. And so uh, when the Israelites did that, they were essentially doing the same thing uh, it's just that they were serving the most high, the one true God, the, the God of, of all gods, uh, so to speak, uh, which is what I discovered. One of the reasons when, for example, uh, Rahab uh, says to the spies who come into Jericho, uh, we've heard about we've heard about you and your God. That was. Uh, culturally, to that time period, that was how battles were believed to be uh, to be fought and won or lost. The, the gods came into battle with you, and whoever's god was greater uh, and wasn't mad at them would allow them to win. So uh, there have been a number of things that uh, that I have, I wouldn't even say understood to be witchcraft, because I'm not sure that uh, historically I've had a great understanding of what it actually is. Um, just a number of things to stay away from, um, kind of like Bobby Boucher's mother, like, no, that's the devil. That's the, de that's the devil too. Um, and so I wouldn't say I've got a firm grasp on it, but even in some of the reading, uh, that I did ahead of this conversation, uh, just looking some things up, a, a lot of the definitions are, uh, for lack of a better, I'll use I'll use the words that I use in my head in in my notes that they are in service to white supremacy, and so there is a particular brand of Christianity that is okay. But like you said, Cowie, if you practice anything that's that's of your native heritage, uh, no, that's not okay. Uh, if you if you practice anything that is of uh, you know, African heritage. Nope, that's automatically witchcraft. The only things that are okay is if we drink blood. The only things that are okay is if we light incense. The only things that are okay is, uh, you know, if we cast spells and give prophecies and and whatnot. So, um, yeah, I would say I'm not entirely sure. I know I know some, and I and there's and I have a lot to learn. So I, I look forward to. The rest of this conversation. I knew he was going to open up a bag of worms. I almost said it. <laughs> oh, yes. yes. Religion has been whitewashed by the European mindset. Mm -hmm. Very much so. All right. Who's next up on, on the circuit? Uh, you, you want to go next? Yeah, I, I'll go next. Okay. So, uh, so. I agree with everything stated already um, concerning witchcraft and how um, it's a vague term. It's a very vague term, and it's it's like a blanket statement. Um, one thing one thing we do know about witchcraft when it comes to scripture is it's not like a even though we may see it mentioned by itself sometimes in scripture, it's not a standalone type thing. It's always related to something else, and um, probably like a couple weeks ago. Me and Austin, we were on the phone, and I think we were, <laughs> it was funny because it didn't start out this way. It started out with us talking about um, the prophet that was to come, like unto Moshe, you know, in, uh, what was that, Exodus 18? Um, I think, is that Exodus 18 or Deuteronomy 18? Let me see. Deuteronomy. 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 So, read that real quick. Let's see. What verse are you going to? Uh, I'm going to the the scriptures version, and that's uh -huh. Deuteronomy 18, verse starting at verse one. Okay, I'll go ahead and read it then. Okay, so just let everybody know what I'm reading out of. Um, it's the interlinear Bible, Hebrew, Greek, English. So, 
chapter 18, the priests, the Levites, all the tribes of Levi shall have no portion or inheritance with Israel. They shall eat fire offerings of Jehovah, even his inheritance, and he shall have no inheritance among his brothers. Jehovah himself is his inheritance, as he has spoken to him. And this shall be the priest's due from the people, from those that offer a sacrifice, whether it's an ox or sheep, that they shall give to the priest the leg and the two cheeks and the stomach and the first of your grain, of your new wine, of your oil, and of the first fleece of your flocks. And you shall give to him. For Jehovah your God has chosen him out of all your tribes to stand to serve in the name of Jehovah, he and his sons continuously. And if a Levite comes from one of your cities out of all of Israel, where he has been living, and he comes with all the desire of his soul to the place which Jehovah shall choose, then he shall serve in the name of Jehovah his God, as all his brothers, the Levites, who stand before Jehovah do. They shall eat portions like portion, except of the sales of what belonged to the, his father. When you come to the land which Jehovah your God is giving to you, you shall not learn to do according to the hateful acts of those nations. There shall, be, there shall not be found in you one who passes his son or his daughters through the fire, one that uses divination, an observer of clouds, or a fortune teller, or a whisperer of spells, or a magic charmer, or one asking of familiar spirits, or a wizard, or one inquiring of the dead. For all are doing these things are an abomination to Jehovah. And because of these filthy acts, Jehovah your God is expelling these nations before you. You can stop you right there. Okay. Sorry. So, so right here. So, as as we see, um, the Most High He has a certain order. Um, we see that initially at the beginning of this chapter, it was about what the priesthood was supposed to be there for. It was about the sacrifices they were supposed to make. It was about Him choosing the Levites out of all of the. Uh, out of all of the tribes of Israel to actually serve him and to make the offerings and to help to bring the rest of the children of Israel into communion with the Most High. And then from there, he compares that and, and contrasts that to what the nations are doing. And as we can see right here, um, that word that you read as, um, it was in verse 10. What's that last word in verse 10 for you, um, Travis? A whisper of spells. Okay, so a whisper of spells right here in the in the good old KJV. That one says a witch. So it says, um, if I read verse ten again, it says, "There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire, that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch." So right here. We can see that verse 11 also says, or a charmer or a consultant with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. So what, what me and Austin had determined um, a couple, a couple of uh, Shabbats ago is that all these years, we have been reading these things individualized, like this person or that person or this person or that person, when really all of these words right here, they're adjectives describing one type of person. Like all of these things are related. The person that was a wizard was also doing divination. The person that's doing divination is also considered a witch. The person that's a charmer is also consulting familiar spirits. So ultimately that's, that's the different order. And, and if we continue reading in verse 13 on down, the Most High, he, um, he actually gives the proper person who can actually commune with him. Because ultimately, it's about if we're communing with Yah or if we're communing with spirits. Mm -hmm. It's like, which one are we, are we, are we communing mm -hmm. with, Yah or the spirits? That's the main thing that separates witchcraft from actually serving the Most High. It's good stuff. But right here, I'm, I'm in the King James Version right here, y'all, because my, my Bible app version is acting up. I got this one downloaded on my phone. But... um. I'm gonna read out of this one, but I'm gonna replace it with, with the, the real name of Yah. So right here it says in verse 13, you shall be perfect with Yah your Elohim for these nations which you shall possess did not, they listened unto the observer of times 
and unto divide and unto diviners. But as for you, Yah your Elohim has not allowed you to do so. Yah your Elohim will raise up from you a prophet from from the midst of you, just like your brothers, like unto me. Unto him you shall listen to, according to all that you that you desired of Yah your Elohim and Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of Yah my, my Elohim, neither let me see this great fire anymore, that I do not die. And Yah said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto me, or like unto you, excuse me, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not listen unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other Elohim, even that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which Yah has spoken or has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of Yahweh, if the thing follows not, nor comes to pass, this is the thing which Yah has not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You should not be afraid of him. So, so this whole chapter, it's all about being decent and in order. It's all about being in order. And the Most High, he has a certain order that we're supposed to go through. One of, one of those things is the Levitical priesthood. The other thing is through the prophets. Now, if we do it any other kind of way, if we try to do it through um, seeking familiar spirits, if we try to get an answer, you know, just like when you're talking about an omen from before, because there's nothing wrong with seeking a sign, but where is the sign originating from? Is it, am I looking at a sign in the heavens, like in the stars, because the most high is the one who rules the stars? Or do I have, am I disconnected from the most high and just practice astrology by itself. Yeah. Because there's nothing wrong with the constellations. The constellations are good because the most high made them to be good. Mm -hmm. But if I'm only seeking to see, to use the constellations to dictate my life and I'm not seeking the most high, then I'm out of order. Yep. Yep. Very good. Very good. So yeah. <laughs> All right. So I guess um I guess it's my turn. I wanted everybody else to go first because that means I get to talk less. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, I agree with everything that's been said before. Um, I definitely applaud uh, Keith for what he said earlier because I was actually meditating on that uh, a few days prior when I was thinking about uh, just meditating upon this conversation. Um, how the definition of what is to be considered, quote, witchcraft, um, even though we're talking about it now, there is a difference between what, quote unquote, the English word witchcraft is defined as in the, in the Bible versus how it's defined in the church. Yes. Um, so one of the issues is similar to Cowie, as was stated. Um, my mother is Eastern Cherokee and Muscogee Creek Nation. Um, and so many of our First Nations traditions, be it, you know, the burning of sage, cedar, sweetgrass, tobacco, um, all of which literally being the smoke symbolizing our prayers going up to the creator, um, the burning of white sage, as well as other sages as well. Um, also, from a scientific perspective, uh, helps clear the ba bad bacteria out of the air by about 94 percent, according to certain studies. So it has medicinal benefits. And also, if made into a tea, it is a anti it's a antibacterial and it's an antiviral. So the creator made all these things for a reason and for a purpose. And I ain't trying to get into that. That's the second question. Uh, but the reason why I wanted to applaud that is because a lot of what is defined as quote unquote witchcraft in the church and within Christianity as a whole has absolutely been formed by white supremacy. Because if you are a black or indigenous person, an African-American or African in general or indigenous person of any first nations, whatever, basically anybody that is not white, then your practice is considered evil, demonic, uh, because it was not done by the white European nations. But anything done by the white European nations, oh, that, that's absolutely acceptable. That's wonderful. That's fine. Uh, everybody sits in the pew and just sings, bringing in the sheaves and uh, does all that and other, and that's fine. But you go into 
an African-American church and you see folk bucking and hollering and shouting and throwing white blankets and this, that, oh, all of a sudden that's the devil, that's demonic. And this, that, that, I thought it said make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I saw it said to praise him with the timbrel and with the dance. You know, I, I could go on for ages about that. But as a First Nations person, especially as I, if you want to call it, quote unquote, came out of the church and started studying Hebrew because, shoot, you start studying and asking questions, you're either going to have to leave or you're going to get thrown out, whichever one you want. Mm -hmm. um, and as I started asking questions and understanding this and really reconnecting to my First Nations heritage, I really, to a certain extent, even though I don't like using this word because people sometimes take it the wrong way, I became somewhat offended at the fact that my ancestors were considered demonic and yes. evil yes. and just just because we, not because we were violating scripture but because we did not do things how i'm gonna sound so southern saying this how white folk do it you know <laughs> and, and, and it's the truth and then me growing up it, it, amongst the african-american communities churches um you know and groupings and schools and so forth uh as i stated earlier and i forgot to include it in my introduction but it's in the other one that the spirituality that I grew up in within the black churches is hoodoo, which is an African-American uh, folk tradition, which is some, some consider magic, some consider not, uh, just depends on how you look at it. Um, but a lot, when, when you look at it purely from the biblical perspective and not what uh, the church has deemed as being such, uh, none of what I was taught, at least what I was taught, can't speak to nobody else, none of what I was taught that can be branded as hoodoo um, can be considered witchcraft. You know, whether that be uh, from they taught us to wash our floors from back to front and pray over your water and the scriptures that was prayed was in the Psalms. And the only person, individual entity, whatever that you are praying to is the most high, the creator, Yah, the Lord, whatever in the world you call him. Uh, so the biblical definition is always going to reign supreme versus yeah. what this denomination, what this church, what this grouping, whatever uh, has deemed to be accurate. Because if it does not line up with that, then it is by definition false. Just because the church says this is wrong, this is evil, this is witchcraft, we always have to go back to what the scripture says. Now, that's part of my own experience, but just in general, as far as my experiences, there's a lot of things that I could, in the past, I would have considered witchcraft, but now not so much. Uh, but just in a general sense, with the knowledge that I have now, I've experienced more, um, shall we say, witchcraft attacks quote unquote from believers yes. than i have from anybody outside of the body yep. there are so many believers christians followers of the messiah whatever verbiage you want to use in whatever capacity that they follow the messiah um there 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 are those in the body that are absolute experts in the utilization of witchcraft as far as attacking other believers manipulation mm -hmm. uh you know, you slander, gossip, speaking evil words, because that's one of the biggest things, speaking of evil words, speaking death or negativity over someone, death and life is in the power of the tongue, et cetera, so forth. We know that scripture. Um, so biblical definition, and like I said, my personal experience, I, I could go all day. Um, but yeah, as far as the biblical definition that I want to emphasize, as far as what I've got to say, is that that is what has to reign supreme. We really need to be cautious in ignorantly throwing around a term that we know so very little about and saying, oh, well, this person is operating in witchcraft or a favorite thing, you know, deliverance ministry, we have to deal with this. Oh, this person has a spirit of witchcraft. There's no such thing. Let me mess with somebody else's religion. There's no such thing in the Bible. You cannot find a spirit of witchcraft in the Bible. You can find practices of what we in English call witchcraft, but you're not going to find a spirit of witchcraft. You're not going to find a lot of spirits that people call out in the Bible. Um, so we always have to go back to scripture and to our best understanding and knowledge with the original language, culture, and context of the scriptures have to define that by what it is. And we literally, everything basically that Christianity considers witchcraft, we all need to throw that out into the garbage and start over. And once you start over with the biblical definition, then we're on the right track to finding some truth. So. That's what okay. I got to say. Good. Love it. One thing I do want to, I, I want to bring out is something I've been thinking about here recently is um, lump summing people into a group like what we were talking about earlier. The scriptures have totally been controlled through, through white supremacy. One of the things I'm noticing is it's predominantly Southern European 
Roman supremacy, not necessarily white. Like there's a lot of people starting to go back to the Scandinavian religions. Mm -hmm. um, Norse pagan. Because they don't want to be associated with the white Roman people. Yeah. Right. That that patriarchy that comes through the papacy and, and the, the rigors that in its own form, I think is a, I'm wondering if witchcraft could be signs, omens, incantations, manipulations, like we were talking about that detracts from the word of Yah, right? God says, every man has knowledge. When we were spread into the 70 nations at the Tower of Babel, we all walked away with the knowledge of clean and unclean animals, right? We all had, they all had the same father. They all had the same grandfather, right? We know Shem was, a, was alive at least until the time of Abraham. So they all had the story firsthand knowledge of the flood, which is why it's in every culture around the world. The, the, the blood sacrifices are in every culture. A lot of these stories that we have are in every culture, right? So we can't just wholesale throw them out the window, right? And this is, this is where I want to start getting into the fuzzy territory because there's a lot of things that, that seem right. Like what I'm learning about uh, First Nations and Indigenous Americans. There's a lot of things that really look real close to scripture. Like they use turquoise. Real close to what, what we're learning is the biblical color of Tekelet, the color of the Zitzi, mm -hmm. right? And that's a very sacred stone to the First Nations. Um, it was also on Aaron's uh, breastplate. Yeah. The, uh, you know, there are the stories of the man with a hole in his hands, right? That came before the stories of Christ ever come across. I was just reading, uh, heard an article today that in 31 AD, the Chinese wrote by proclamation of the, the uh, emperor, there was a, the yin and yang had sw switched. Light had become dark and dark had become light. They'd gotten confused in the middle of the day. And that was the sign that all sins have been laid upon one man. They didn't know who that man was, but they knew that all sin had been laid upon one man. And all men were now free. I was 31 AD. There is no way they had a Christian evangelist go tell them about that. So how did they know, right? Um, when it comes to things like divination, we have prophets all over the place. It's like God said, well, I've heard people in the occult say the spirits told me. And they're right. Right? And that's been used for good and evil on both sides of the fence, which is why I think we're supposed to study and show ourselves the fruit. One more thing, and then I'll let you jump in. So before we get too far into this, I want to go back to the chapter that you read. Our discussion on who Messiah is, I think, needs to be expanded because this chapter very, very prominently points to who Messiah is. And it gets the backdrop of who the priests were on both sides of the fence. And it's it's really makes me look at what his purpose was a little bit differently as the perfect standard, right? It's why we can't follow the priests and the prophets always. We have to follow Messiah and the perfect example that he gave. So what do you want to say? Um, <clears throat> two things I want to mention um, that I have observed about witchcraft that I think are rarely ever mentioned, and I feel like it really helps to understand what it is. First thing is, uh, for us, when we're hearing from a prophet, an actual prophet, or if we're hearing from the voice of Yah, that's one voice, one. If you go to a diviner or a, psych a psychic, um, they're hearing from many voices, and that's what makes it very confusing. If you're, if you're just hearing from one voice, you get one message, that's it. 
If you're hearing from many, that's that's witchcraft. That's what witchcraft is. And it's a confusion of what's so how you how do you know who's right? <laughs> um, and um, the other thing is what I have. I really think what it comes down to is control. And I see control in the church more than I ever see it anywhere else. There's controls everywhere. You see it in politics. You see it all over the place. Um, but I see so much control in the church. I also see that with people who practice witchcraft. It's all about control. It's controlling the elements, controlling your own surroundings, controlling people so that they do what you, what you want them to do. That's just, correct me if I'm wrong, Austin, I know that you actually have more experience in the occult than probably any of us, but <clears throat> that's what I have observed. And I just wanted to throw that out there because I feel like it really, it really helps to define what they are. Oh, man. Uh, if I may make a suggestion, Yeshaya, I know you got your 430 and whatnot, so maybe you ought to go next. Oops. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like, like currently just uh just thing. Uh, I, I agree. You know, at the end of the day, going back to what we said earlier, it's always going to go back to who are you addressing, you know, and um and a lot of things that the church calls witchcraft, just like what also said earlier, it's not witchcraft because um, even if you go back to Deuteronomy 18, and if you go before that to Deuteronomy 13, is are you doing it the way y'all said do it, or are you doing it your own way? You know, just like when um when Samuel had rebuked Saul, and he said, you know, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, you know, um, and stubbornness is as idolatry. So at the end of the day, witchcraft and idolatry are all connected. It's like, are you doing things? the way that y'all wants you to do it. And even when it comes to being a prophet, you know what I'm saying? Like it's a lot of folks who call themselves prophets, but number one, if what they're saying is what they're saying coming to pass, that's one thing. Is it coming to pass? Did it come to pass or did it not come to pass? The next thing is, is what they're saying going to lead you to obey the Torah and obey Yah. If it doesn't lead you to obey Yah and it doesn't come to pass, that is a false prophet. And that person is operating in the spirit of divination. And even if it does come to pass, just like what, what Kali said is, you know, like the familiar spirits know stuff too. I mean, you gotta think about it. Spirits have been here since before we were born. So they're gonna know things about your family. They're gonna know personal information about you. They're going to know all these different things. So you can consult a familiar spirit and get an answer back. But at the same time, is that spirit going to lead you to obey, obey the Torah in spirit and in truth? Or is that spirit going to lead you to, like what Kyle said, manipulate? Is, is it going to lead you to do it for money? You know what I'm saying? Like you got certain prophets, I'm not going to say any names, that go around and they go and they prophesy, quote unquote, to people just so they can get more money. You know, filthy lucre, right? So with that being said, it's like, who's getting the glory out of it? Is it the most high? Is he get is he getting the glory? And is it causing people to repent and turn back to Yah? Because if, if it's not, then it's witchcraft, even if they call themselves a prophet, even if they don't uh wear a a, a cape or a ride on a, a broomstick or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Even if they don't have a black cat. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's still witchcraft regardless. Most of the witches, they dressed up in suits and ties in the churches. You know what I'm saying? And next thing you know, you know, I can speak personally, you know, you have a leaders getting the congregation to come and attack you. You know what I mean? That's witchcraft. That's rebellion. That is manipulation. That's mind control. So, and I'm not trying to come up against the church, but what I'm saying is that just because that, just because people are in the church, it doesn't mean they're obeying Yah. And just because people are not in the typical church that we think they should be in, it doesn't mean they're disobeying Yah. You know, you should know them by their fruits. So witchcraft is always going to be, are they in order or are they out of order? That's, that's as simple as it gets. Right. Yeah, you can go ahead, uh, Austin. Okay. Um, so as far as that's concerned, because I know now we've shifted a little bit talking about the specific things. Um, obviously, Yeshaya said the bulk of it, so I'm just going to hit a few points um, because I think b basically we're all in agreement that what matters is who are you getting your information from? 
who are you connected to? Who are you in fellowship with? Who are you in relationship with? Because one, one of the most profound yet simple uh, things that I learned from the Riverwinds many years ago um, was looking at it, even though the English words that I'm about to use are going to make some people go, um, <laughs> um, the, the fact of the matter is things like what we call in English summoning. Uh, basic definition of being even, and I don't have it wrote in front of me, so I'm paraphrasing. Uh, the concept of summoning is, in simple matter, calling on whatever God you serve or calling on a spirit or spirits to come to you and assist you or communicate with you or do A, B, C, D in line with whatever. We see this same concept in scripture. Now, as the Riverwinds taught it, was that there is, uh, to use these, you know, cliched terms, there is a kingdom of light perspective and there is a kingdom of darkness perspective. Uh, everything originated from the kingdom of light, meaning everything, every concept, every uh, truth, if you will, every practice in some form or another, or at least the concept of it originated with the most high. We see the creator extolling us many times in scripture, even though this, some people may say this just sounds blasphemous, but the fact is, he said, call upon me and I will answer you. Those who call upon the name of Yah shall be delivered, shall be saved, shall be uh, A, B, C, D, whatever. We are extolled again and again to call upon his name, to call upon him, uh, to seek him for protection, to seek him for our provision, uh, abundance, whatever. All of this in its rudimentary term in the English language, that is summoning. You are calling upon Yah. You are quote unquote summoning him, even though from a certain perspective, you cannot summon him anyway, because he will either answer or he won't. Um, but the fact of the matter is to anyone to from a certain perspective, both within the body and outside of the body, that is summoning. You see the exact same concept and the exact same thing practiced in cultures outside of the body or in people groups or practices, religions, whatever, outside of the body. The exact same thing is done. The difference is who are they summoning? Who are they calling upon? They're not calling upon Yah. They're not calling upon the Most High. They may be calling upon this deity or that deity or this spirit, the spirit of this person, the spirit of that person, uh, whatever it may be. And they may be getting in contact with whomever or whatever. Um, another example, so this a little bit from my background, uh, from the, you know, the hoodoo that I grew up in. Uh, when people hear the word conjure, they think of sort of the same thing as summoning. But in the hoodoo tradition, conjuring does not always mean summoning. If you are conjuring something or you are performing a conjure, that is the same as you taking a bottle of oil and praying over it and praying scriptures over it and anointing it and consecrating it unto the creator to do, whether it's healing, whether it's protection, whether it's whatever. In hoodoo, that's conjuring. Uh, you are imbuing that specific substance with power. You are Im imbuing, quote unquote, with whatever in the world it is you need it to do. And the specific instance being whether it's uh, whether you're utilizing it for healing. So if it's healing, you would speak healing scriptures over it. If it's protection, you would speak protection scriptures over it, et cetera, so forth. So literally, the same thing that's being done in, quote unquote, church, in, quote unquote, religious circles is the exact same thing being done in non-religious circles, non-church circles. We see the exact same thing being practiced. So as far as the specific uh, things that you mentioned in the second question, uh, when people especially like with the First Nations, as I said, you know, with the old sage and the burning of sage and this, that's just, that's just demonic. That's the devil. Number one, you ain't got no scripture to back that up. Uh, number two, it has to do with who is the incense dedicated to? Who is the sense that symbolizes your prayers? Who are your prayers going up to? What entity are your prayers being offered up to? Um, and then I always give a rebuttal because they say, well, this is demonic. That's the devil and that's the devil. And I said, well, do you know what else is demonic? You know what else is witchcraft? Anointing oil. What I was just talking about. And people's like, how can you yep. say that? Because it's in the Bible. How could you possibly? Um, do we not realize, and maybe some people forget this, uh, those that practice the dark arts, if you will, witchcraft, whatever verbiage you want to go, use anointing all too. Those yes. that uh, utilize other spirits and have ulterior motives, uh, manipulation that do practice ABCD, whatever, they utilize anointing all too. Anointing all is not specific to scripture alone you got your finger up what you got to say <laughs> on top of that lavender is not one of the oils in scripture mm -hmm. if you want to be clear with anointing oil you had better one be of the lineage of Aaron 
And two, use the right ones. mix it appropriately to scripture. And three, don't you only use it in, in the temple? And it's only, like I said, that, that you better be of the lineage of Aaron. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's for temple use only. So, yeah. so if we're going to be that legalistic. If you're going to go that far with it, nobody should be doing any kind of oil on nobody. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Oh, you fine. Look, the, the only other instance, uh, at least off the top of my head, I know oil was used to anoint kings of Israel, um, quote unquote anoint. And it's arguable as to what kind of oil was used. Some would argue that it's, you know, the purest olive oil there is, you know, extra virgin olive oil. Uh, we see the instance in Yeshua, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's in James and maybe another place where it talks about uh, gather the elders. If there's any sick among you, gather the elders, have them anoint you with oil and pray over you, that type of stuff. Uh, one thing that we are forbidden, as you mentioned, you know, about the anointing oil in the temple, there's a specific recipe that only the Levites are commanded to use. And if anybody, I saw it on TV one time and it made my blood boil. Uh, some Christian broadcasting thing, bless their hearts and their heads, uh, formulated what they call the king's oil, meaning they used the exact same formula from Exodus. And they made it and were trying to sell it to people saying, oh, use this because that's the most powerful anointing oil there is because it's from Exodus. I'm like, did we not read a few verses after or before? I forget where it's at that only the Levites in the tabernacle and the temple were allowed to use this. So if you would love to go right on ahead and curse yourself, your household, and whatever in the world you throw that anointing oil on, by all means. If you want to wake up dead or some mess, by all means, please use that whole thing. I look, and I ain't going to pray it off of you either because if you was that crazy, then that's your problem. Um, now, as far as that's concerned, I like I said, I use the example of anointing oil, but I'll get to my pet peeve. Um, so for everybody that wonders, I do wire wrap crystals uh, as a side business. Uh, uh, yeah, so look, she got hers on. Um, so with the concept of crystals, I always tell people, um, because I could use many examples, I could use the crystals and stones that's on Aaron's breastplate. Um, you know, if they are evil and demonic, then the creator would not have commanded him to put something evil and demonic on his breastplate and then carry it into the holy place and the holy of holies or anywhere near the holy of holies as a matter of fact mm -hmm. and then we, we ain't even got to talk about the, the urim and the thummim stones that uh were arguably arguably used for divination purposes quote unquote divination purposes uh what would be considered by worldly terms anyway because they were used to quote unquote divine a yes or no answer from the most high uh the priests cast lots to get a yes or no answer from the most high the apostles cast lots in order to get a yes or no answer as to who the next quote unquote apostle would be to replace Judas from a outsider looking in that's divination so that shows you right there that whether you're using physical components or not the issue is not uh the usage of said physical components the issue is again going back to are you speaking to the most high to Yah, to, to the Elohim of the universe, or are you speaking to other gods, other spirits, whatever? Now, back to the crystals. I could use Aaron's breastplate. I could use the fact that um, the foundation of the New Jerusalem is built on 12 uh, precious gemstones, crystals, you know, whatever verbiage you want to use. Again, he would not create the holy city uh, out of something that's evil and demonic. Uh, but I'm always going to guide people back to Genesis. If you just want to make it absolutely simple. Genesis, when it gives you the, the six days of creation and on the seventh day he rested, which is where we get the concept of Shabbat. I forget which day it is, but he made the dry land, formed everything on it, the plant life, the dirt, the dry part, the rocks, which means the rocks and the crystals and the stones that are in the ground and whatnot. At the end of that day of creating the dry land, he called it good. So I always tell people, we overstep our place, even though being made in his image, even though sons and daughters of the most high, yes, we got authority, we got power and all that, but we overstep our place as his creation to dare and have the audacity to call evil and demonic that which he has decreed since the beginning is good. So the issue is not, oh, well, this is evil and that's demonic just automatically just because we look at it, just because certain people or cultures or groups or whatever use it for whatever purpose. The issue is who are you communicating with? Who are you in communion with? Because even though you, you mentioned psychics uh, briefly earlier, uh, if we really want to get technical about that, even though that's commonly used as an identifier as far as people, um, that's actually a scientific term because it has to do with your psyche. Because your psyche is activated and then, you know, as far as like the visions and your dreams, when, when you're having dreams, your psyche is activated. 
that's how you're able to see and perceive all this stuff. Now, I ain't going to get into the scientific because I'm by no means a scientist. You're shy as the scientist out of the two of us. So I'm not going to try and get on him and sound crazy. Um, <laughs> but all that being said, that's a scientific term to describe a spiritual event because science is not going to call it spirits. Science is not going to call it spiritual. So by definition, if you have a prophetic dream, if you have a vision where you see a spirit or spirits, or you have some type of vision that's prophetic or something of it like that, that by scientific definition would be called a psychic event. You are having a psychic experience. What we would term as being attacked by witchcraft or experiencing a quote unquote witchcraft attack, science would call that a quote unquote psychic attack. So the difference is what is scientific, and what we consider spiritual. They are two groupings describing the exact same thing. We just love to argue over at times, semantics. semantics. So all that being said, all these different items that were mentioned, you know, crystals, the, the most high deemed them as good. Now, as far as crystals concerned, I'll say this and then I'll get off crystals. Um, <laughs> uh, as far as they are concerned, there are, as with all of creation, just like I could go down the list of different herbs and what herbs do, you know, lavender helps with headaches, helps with tension, helps with anxiety, worry, depression, the, the list goes on. Um, the creator made stones and crystals to have certain natural properties that have nothing to do with anything metaphysical, whoop -de -whoop -de -whoop, none of that. All of us who have smartphones, we're carrying around quartz crystals. Because quartz crystals are in our phones. Quartz crystal, quartz itself, whatever version you have, uh, is an amplifier. It can ag um, amplify electromagnetic waves. It can amplify um, and make it, make it a receptor of the waves that you receive in order to have phone calls and internet and all that. Other. Just like there are crystals and stones that can disrupt said waves, such as black tourmaline, hematite. Um, I could go down the list of things that disrupt the different electromagnetic waves. Um, cell phone type waves that way we can have these conversations and whatnot there are stones and crystals that have a natural property that block that out that's why when you get in a certain place in a rock quarry you ain't got no signal or you get behind certain metals in a building and you have no signal because these things have natural properties to block out those mm -hmm. waves that's not ooey gooey gumdrop that's not nothing crazy that's just what the creator made them for so we really have to draw the line uh, now, as as far as like with anointing oil, and I've said this before too, whether it's with water, whether it's with salt, whether it's with crystals, from a scientific standpoint, all of these things are, shall you say, for lack of better terms, containers for energy. When you pray over oil or you pray over an item, just like when you pray over a person, you are quote unquote imbuing them with something. You are releasing something from yourself and giving it to them. You, the scripture would call it an impartation, and some would say it's an ordination. It's the laying on of hands and transference, if you will. So you pray over all and you are imparting something to it. And scientifically, the all, the water, the salt, the crystal, whatever, is recording whatever it is you are speaking, be it positive, be it negative, be it the intention that you have, whatever you want to call it. That's why you see so many um, battlefields across the U.S. I use that as an example um, that a lot of people perceive as haunted quote unquote, that has spirits. There, there may be some truth to that. There may be spirits at that place. It's possible, not always the case. The majority of what you see as to why people experience apparitions, quote unquote, at those places, the stones, the crystals, the dirt, the ground itself has recorded because of the strong emotions, which emotions are energy and motion. It has recorded the strong emotions and the horror and the death and whatever that occurred there. So now you see replays. These apparitions, a lot of times, are what you would term residual energy. It is a replay. The stones and the crystals have recorded what occurred. And now that's why sometimes you hear echoes of gunfire. There ain't no guns on that battlefield. That was 100, 200, 300 years ago. But you hear echoes of gunfire. Why? It is a record. These things record energy, just like water records energy. All records energy. It records emotion. That's why there's power when you pray over something. So... All these things, going back to it, just simply is the point. All these different items that you listed, it has to do with your intention, and it has to do with who you are communicating with. Uh, are you communicating with the Most High? Are you communicating with another spirit, another God, a deity, whatever? Uh, and that is going to be your determining factor as to whether or not it will be considered, quote, biblically acceptable or not.
You preaching today, okay. Austin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's always preaching. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Love that. Okay, so um, one more thing I wanted to mention. <laughs> I really want to talk about the drum because I see so many double standards all over the place, not just in the church, but out there in native land um, regarding drums. And one of the things that gets on my nerves the most specifically is in um, Christian churches. And they say, oh, you can't bring that drum in here. That's evil. That's like me saying that when a man goes into a school or not even a man, a woman, a person goes into a school with a gun and kills all these kids. That's like me saying the gun is evil. No, it's not the gun. It's the person behind him who uses it that makes it evil. Same is true for any drum. Not only that, let's, how about, how about the fact that just about every church across America has a drum set? Well, not every single one. Some of them are so conservative. They don't have a drum set. But the ones that do have a drum set, these drum sets are made by monks all the way out. Where are these monks at? They're, um, they're different places. I can't remember. They're made by some monks way somewhere else in Asia or something. Why is that okay and not a native drum? Because, because the church has made it out to be something evil when it's not evil. And there's so many double standards in that. And then we wonder why in politics, everybody's so confused and they think that a certain item is evil when it's not evil. So I just wanted to add that there's also, what, what, what is the difference between like, so how, how do we define what divination is, what sorcery is, what is necromancy? Um, I mean, we can also talk about the drinking of blood if you want. I, I feel like all of us, most people would agree that that's pretty disgusting except for the most deprived people in this world. Um, but yeah, did you want to say anything else? Yeah, on the subject of necromancy, um, talking about, somebody was talking about, I think it was the Catholic priest was talking about praying to the, the saints, right? About how they're, they are in the cloud of witnesses in eternity beyond time. And so they pray to them, not so much in worship, but just to have a, a conversation with, like, how did you do that? Would you go through, help me through this piece? Because you did this, I wanted it too. Um, and then in the new apostolic reformation that's going on, a lot of people discuss the thing about having a conversation with the cloud of witnesses, being able to talk to those who have gone on and live in eternity. Like, at what point would this be considered necromancy in conversing with the dead? Like, are we, you know, when do we call somebody dead? Can I come in on that, at least? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then Austin, he, he gonna definitely tear it up because he, he definitely brought something out about the transfiguration um, before. But, um, but, but nevertheless, um, at that point, then it's like we have to have a proper understanding of the state of the dead and where they are and what they're doing. Um, so if we have a biblical understanding of the state of the dead, you know, even though people want to argue about this, is that the dead are asleep. You know, they haven't been judged yet. So they haven't been taken to purgatory. They're not in Abraham's bosom. Um, so like Lazarus and his story about the, uh, the rich man and the beggar, we got to go through and break that down because that was a parable that the Messiah made about Abraham's bosom. So ultimately, the dead are actually asleep right now. And Austin brought this up, and which we talked about this is just because somebody is is they may have saw their dead grandmother or or a dead uncle or whatever it might be, it doesn't necessarily mean that was a spirit. It doesn't mean that was the spirit of the dead grandmother or 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 a spirit or, or a demonic spirit as the church would like. Also, he gonna really tear this part up when I go. So I'm just gonna leave it real brief. But it doesn't mean that it's a demonic spirit just because you saw that. So, all right, now, first and foremost, we have to know that the Bible says that we're not supposed to communicate with the dead. That's, that's what the Bible, the Bible clearly says that even when we go back to Deuteronomy 18, we end up going to the Strong's Concordance and looking up the definition of a charmer, of a sorcerer, of a spirit, spiritist, um, of a necromancer. They all mean the same thing, but they're just different words used to describe the same thing. And it has to do with people that are trying to communicate with spirits to get answers from, from a certain spirit that's not the most high. So 
So just in that, even like when you go back to the Witch of Endor, when she uh, when she brought up Samuel's spirit, um, it according to scripture, that was not Samuel's spirit, even though that uh, that particular spirit told them what was going to happen. Because we already know a spirit can tell you what's going to happen. Because it's not like just like we can see prophecy and we can see in the in the future, and, and the Most High can show us certain things. These spirits still have certain access to being able to see certain things that are in the future. So just with that being said, um, all of those things are related. It has to do with talking to the dead and communicating with the dead to divine and answer. So for anybody praying to the saints and all that, that would be that would be right there, like borderline breaking that scripture right there, honestly, you know? And I, I want to hear what Austin has to say because I, I didn't want to share what he wanted to say because we talked about this the other day. So I, I just want to listen before I go into the building. So um, as far as that's concerned, piggybacking off of that, um, me and Yeshaya did have this conversation, um, similar to it anyway. So as, as simple as it may sound, I was the creator brought me back to the transfiguration because yes, I agree. It does have to go back to um, where, what you believe as far as what scripture says is the state of the dead, which is that they are asleep. Um, whereas there's a few that people might try to say hint at them being in whether, whether you call it hev heaven, whether you call it paradise, whatever, there's a multitude, a slew of scriptures that would suggest uh, that they are asleep and they are asleep until the first resurrection. But that's subject for another time. We're not going to talk about that. Um, <laughs> but if you look at it from that perspective, this further bolsters the fact that just because you see what you would perceive as a human spirit, uh, somebody that has passed on, dead, whatever, whomever or whatever they may be, um, it is incorrect to say that that's automatically a demonic or a familiar spirit, um, which is uh, obviously not, and probably not in every church, but it's predominant in Christianity and in the Torah observant movement too, because bless their hearts, they'd be jumping on some of the same rabbit trails that church folk do, Lord have mercy. Uh, anyhow, so when you think about it from that perspective, that quote unquote, the dead are asleep, even though you're not supposed to contact them, the only spirit that will be conjured up according to scripture would be a familiar spirit. When you think about it from that perspective, who then was Messiah seeing and conversing with at the Mount of Transfiguration? Who then were the three disciples seeing and perceiving uh, at the Mount of Transfiguration? Because they clearly identified them as Moshe, as Moses, and Eliyahu, Elijah. So it didn't say it was a familiar spirit, because when we make that blanket statement, this is why I try to avoid blanket statements. Um, when we make blanket statements of anytime you see a spirit that you perceive as a dead person, dead relative, whatever, that is automatically a demon, it's automatically a familiar spirit. That is a false blanket statement, because as I said, who then was the Messiah conversing with? By making that statement, we're inadvertently saying that the Messiah was conversing with demons at the Mount of Transfiguration because those was two quote unquote perceivably dead people. They've been dead for a long time. So you mean to tell me that the Messiah was conversing with familiar spirits? Um, George, I think not. I don't think so. Uh, so with that being said, because if you go down a few verses uh, in that story about the Transfiguration, Messiah came out and it depends on the gospel that you read. He said, tell the vision to no one. And it says that they told the vision unto no one. Uh, just because you have a vision does not mean that is what is literally occurring. As Yeshaya said earlier, um, just because that is what you are seeing does not mean it is a literal spirit. Sometimes the creator can be giving you symbolism, whether it's for comfort, whether it's for encouragement, whether it's for whatever type of prophetic uh, instance and whatnot. Um, so as I said, that proves right there, if we're under the presumption from scripture that the dead are asleep, the Mount of Transfiguration proves that you can have a vision or visions of somebody that you perceive is dead or has passed, whether it's family member or otherwise, and it can be from the creator for a specific purpose without it being a demon or a familiar spirit. So I said all that, say, at least about that specific instance, that we really need to avoid blanket statements, just like we're talking about the whole witchcraft conversation in general. Um, we cannot, or at least not, um, with a certain amount of intelligence, uh, state that all of this, everything that the church and Christianity teaches is witchcraft is 100% uh, witchcraft. 
that is a very ignorant statement to make because as i said earlier we tied it back to the whole you know quote unquote white supremacy thing and whatnot everything like with the drums i'll comment on that as a first nations individual uh when we think about the drum uh white europeans did not play the drums in their churches over there over yonder whatever at least not in all cases um and when they came over here they brought their religion with them and anybody that did the opposite because they looked at us as first nations people they see us dancing around the fire the sacred fire um and they see us playing the drum and singing unto yah unto the creator unto the most high um and they say that that's demonic that's the devil yet scripture says uh, to praise him with the timbrel and with the dance. So that covers the dancing part, but that is not the best translation when it comes to the Hebrew as far as timbrel, uh, because when you say timbrel, it, they think of a tambourine. But when we look at it from the Hebraic standpoint, it is a skin or a hide stretched over wood and beaten either with a stick or with a hand. They did not have the, me the mechanics at the time in ancient times to put the little symbols that we have on modern day tambourines. So there were no symbols on the proverbial tambourine. It was what we as First Nations would consider a hand drum, a, a drum that you hold in your hand and you strike with a stick or strike with your hand. So something that the Creator commands us to use to honor and praise and worship Him, we're again taking what He ordained and deemed as honorable, as praiseworthy, as whatever, and we're taking it and calling it evil and demonic. Because like you said, there's drum sets in many churches uh, I know one story the river winds told was they were invited to speak at some church, wherever and what it was, even, even if I knew the denomination, I wouldn't say the name just to be nice. Um, they were walking in with their hand drums to, you know, continue on with the service and whatnot, because there was a musical selection as well as whatever teaching they were going to offer. Um, and they were told by deacons or whomever, the, you know, the, 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 the posse, if you will, uh, that they weren't allowed to bring their drums in there. Now, if you peek over deacon elder so-and-so's uh, shoulder you'll see that there's a big old drum set on the stage the difference is it says yamaha on it and so she said now if i write yamaha on my drum will it be acceptable now because that's exactly what you got up there yep. so there is an immense amount of hypocrisy when it comes to these different things when it comes to um what is perceived as good because most of what we perceive as being good or acceptable in the church in christianity is not coming from scripture it is coming from uh the colonized european western society and what its culture deemed as good and right and acceptable because why is a yamaha drum set that was made wherever and whatever used in churches acceptable but first nations drums are not accepted african drums are not accepted and i could go through a list of drums why are they not accepted because as with any of these other practices, the issue is always going to go back to who or what it is dedicated to. Who are the songs going up to? Who is the praise being made to? Who are the petitions being offered up to? Because if it's quote unquote, any deity, if you will, besides the creator, besides the God of Israel, then that's where you get into the territory of it is incorrect. It is um, perceived as idolatry, whatever have you. Um, so yeah, I had to throw that bit about the drum in there, but I'm at that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Keith, did you want to? Thank yeah, you. I, I, I would love to. Um, yeah, there, there's a few scriptures that come to mind just from a, a number of things that have been that have been said and shared, and I'm I'm in agreement with with so much. Uh, so much of it. I was even thinking about the the different types of drums. Like you said, you, you can't have a First Nations or an African drum, but you can have Yamaha or DW. Uh, you can have Zildjian cymbals, uh, all of that, um, so long as it uh, fits into a certain, uh, a certain type of culture, a certain type of culture. Uh, and uh, one of the scriptures that, that I think of, um, and I went back and, and took a look at it, uh, it was uh, Balaam. Balaam was a, div a diviner. He was a prophet, not a prophet of, of the God of Israel, but a prophet nonetheless for hire. He was hired, hired to curse. And when he went to consult, whomever he would consult, the Lord Most High spoke up and said, don't you go down there. 
<laughs> and long story short, the scripture here, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind that I've heard quoted more times than I can remember all my life was spoken by a prophet for hire to curse Israel. Yet in the end, he spoke the word of the Lord, even though he was not a prophet like, like we would call Moses or, uh, or Isaiah or Jeremiah, he spoke the word of the Lord. And in, his, in what scripture, at least in this translation uh, that I have in front of me, which is the uh, English Standard Version, records what he has to say as an oracle. Now, oracles are supposed to be bad. Prophecy is okay, but oracles are bad. But in his third oracle, he says, the oracle of Balaam, son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is open, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High. It, it all goes back to what, what everyone has been saying. Who is it? Who is the source and who is it on behalf of? And that that makes it makes all the difference. Uh, Austin, what, what you shared earlier uh, about the you know the English definitions for for summon and and conjure, the the canon literally ends with a summon. Come, Lord Jesus. <laughs> so <laughs> you know. So so what? Do we, what are we what are we actually what are we actually talking about uh, but again i i agree it has everything to do with who is who is the source what is the purpose and i believe that the the idea to assume the posture that i or me or my church my organization uh, has it is the authority on what is or is not uh, of God, where Scripture is not black and white, absolutely clear. Um, to me, is partaking of the fruit, the one that we weren't supposed to partake of, the knowledge of good and evil. Now I get to decide what's good. I get to decide what's wrong. Oh no, naked, cover that up. Well, who told you that? Who who, who said that? Uh, there are absolutely things that that are witchcraft and and sorcery and and again, who are you? Who are you calling upon? Are you putting your crystal out under a full moon because you believe the power comes from the moon? And there's no other, and there's no higher authority than that. I think those things matter. At the same time, if we really want to throw away everything that we think is not Christian by a by a Western standard, then we need to start calling the days of the week and months of the year by other names. We need to we need to use some other languages, um, because you know Sunday is not Son of God Day. That was a different that was a different God Son. That was a, you know the worship of the sun Monday, the worship of the moon. Uh, so we need to words words have meanings. Words have meanings, and witchcraft exists. There are there are particular practices that uh, that I believe are, are are evil, are demonic. It doesn't necessarily mean that everything that looks like it is that, because again, to to what Austin said, um, Jesus practiced uh, necromancy along with Peter, James, and John up on that mountain. And are we now saying that, that Jesus was sinning? Because if, if, if the Messiah was sinning, then that, that, that's supposed to be the thread that holds everything together, is, is his perfect life. So uh, I think we have to be very careful in in what we assign how we sign it i know people who they get a new place and we'll we'll have a pastor come over and pray with blessed oil or we'll we'll light some sage and walk through the house and pray if they're praying to if they're praying to the most high god how how is that how is that witchcraft i don't so 
I, I have, I offer and I, and I have more questions than I have answers. That was awesome. So that kind of really leads in. Oh, go ahead, Austin. <laughs> um, I, I did want to say, I want to hit on a few things that uh, Keith said, uh, but I also had one more thing I wanted to bring up just as far as the witchcraft thing in general. And then y'all say whatever words you need to say. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be quiet after that. Um, so like it's it's important the intention and also I, i've learned over the past several years that it's important not only to have a quote unquote spiritual uh understanding but you absolutely need to even though some of us didn't like science i was one of those people i despised science in school uh but you need to have a scientific understanding uh it would behoove all of us to do scientific studies on these you know different things and concepts and whatnot uh because i know you had briefly mentioned um uh, placing crystals out under the full moon or under the new moon or under the sun or this, that, and third. Uh, there are specific things that are taking place scientifically at that time that I cannot quote off the top of my head. Um, my, my brain don't hold that, that much. It holds a little bit, but not that much. Um, but there are absolutely scientific things that occur at that time. You know, the sun is charging. The moon has a certain amount of charge. People say, well, that sounds esoteric. But wait a minute, when you think about it, uh, number one, just using the moon as an example, the moon changes the tides and the waves in the ocean. Our bodies are made of about 70% water, which is why they say the freaks and the crazy people come out at the full moon. moon as, the phases, as the phases of the moon change, uh, our bodies can be affected because, and our moods, you know, because energy and motion, that's emotion. Um, if we can be affected and the tides in the ocean can be affected. All of creation responds to this entire thing, this creation that we live on and around. The sun affects everything. We get vitamin D from the sun. If you spend time out in the sun, your, your body not only absorbs vitamin D, but your skin becomes darker, your hair becomes darker. If you stay inside and stay away from the sun, your skin becomes lighter, your hair becomes lighter, and it becomes thinner to an extent. Um, like I said with the moon, the moon affects us, you know, in various ways. So placing our crystals outside to be charged, whether it's by the sun or the moon, if we have the proper biblical perspective, um, mm -hmm. then there's nothing wrong with that from a biblical standpoint anyway. Because I hear people all the time, and this is probably going to come up, somebody going to say it in the comments, and Lord help them. Everybody always say, oh, here we go. Them folk is out there worshiping crystals and worshiping rocks. Do you know that with my experience in the church, in the spiritual and metaphysical community, in the Torah observing community, all over the places that I've been, I have never seen not one instance of a person worshiping a rock. I have never seen one instance of a person putting uh, a clear quartz and an amethyst up on a pedestal, burning some incense to it, and oh, Mr. Clear Quartz and Mr. Amethyst, I need you to do A, B, C, D for me. Uh, I need you to bless my finances. I need you to bring abundance into my life. I need you to blah, blah, blah. Amen. I've never seen nobody do that. There is, no, unless somebody does that, unless they are mm -hmm. literally praying to the crystal, petitioning the crystal to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, something other that the scripture would consider, quote, idolatry, then outside of that, there is no such thing as this phenomena that has recently come up in the past 20, 30, 40 years of uh, if you see people utilizing crystals for various purposes, physical, spiritual, whatever, uh, that they're worshiping it. There's no such thing because they're not worshiping the crystals. They're not petitioning the crystals to do A, B, and C, whatever. If they're placing the crystals out in the sun or the moon to be charged, that has nothing to do with idolatry either. They're not asking the moon to do anything. They're not asking the sun to do anything. There are physical, scientific properties and things that are occurring at that moment in time. Um, now, the one thing that I wanted to bring up, uh, because this just it randomly crossed my mind, is, you know, it goes back to the being careful about the whole uh, witchcraft thing, but also specifically having discernment when we are, because there is such thing, that's, that's a very real thing. You know, even though we're continuing to define and see what it is biblically versus what religion has taught us, we have to have discernment nonetheless, because as we said before, there are things that are being called witchcraft that are not. So one phenomenon that I've seen over the past 10 years uh, is that any prophecy, or a word or whatever that comes from the preacher, the prophet, the bishop, the elder, the, 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 the bobo, the whatever, uh, that is perceived as negative or that is perceived as a rebuke or correction or whatever, 
uh, that's branded as witchcraft because it's not positive because they say God doesn't do that. Um, have we not read the Hebrew Bible? Have we not read Jeremiah, one of my Hebrew names, Jeremiah? Have we not read Jeremiah? Jeremiah was whooping everybody's tail with the word, rebuking this and correcting this and repent and return to the Torah and do this and do that. Isaiah was doing the same thing. You, you could go down the list. Uh, the example that I give, and this is not to toot my own horn, this is just, you know, personal experience. So um, I attended uh, a church for a period of, I want to say about a year, a year and a half, something like that. Uh, the creator got a hold of me heavily and I wound up getting in front of the congregation and prophesying several different things that would occur, that repentance needed to occur, uh, return to his ways needed to occur because there was, you know, there was sand, there was degradation, there was, I forget all that was named. Uh, the end of the prophecy being, uh, because they had been warned several times, and there's a whole story with this that I ain't got time for, that if they did not repent, the creator said he would remove their lampstand and give it to one who would obey him, he would close the doors of the church. Mm. Now, that would immediately to some of these all positive and wonderful Christian people that, oh, that's the devil, that's witchcraft. How dare you speak against this pastor? How dare you speak against this church? Well, guess what? Here we are eight years later and the church is closed and the pastor was removed or stepped down or whatever before uh, the close down occurred. You know, and so we have to be careful. I, I give that example to say that we have to be careful again what we brand as witchcraft demonic or the devil because just because the abundance of love and compassion and mercy and grace is spoken about in scripture when it comes to the hebrew word for grace chen, this isn't just talking about grace to do whatever in the word you want to a license to sin or whatever grace is our empowerment to obey his commandments he has empowered us to walk in obedience to him so we do not have an excuse there is mercy for when we fall short of the glory of Yah, absolutely. But grace is the enablement, the empowerment of the Most High within us to do what he has called us to do. He has strengthened us and enabled us to do so. Uh, so I gave that example to say that, number one, we have to be very careful of what we call that. But also on the flip side of it, because it happens heavily in any realm when it comes to uh, things that are prophecy or the prophetic, we also have to be wary of people utilize your discernment because i can't tell you I, I have a mouth on me just in case y'all ain't figured that out um i have no qualms about offending people so i've had i can't tell you the amount of times i have had people walk up to me in church in a congregational assembly type setting uh and pe people come up and say oh well i hear the lord saying blah 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 and he's telling you this or Sometimes it was positive. Sometimes it was negative. Sometimes it was good. Sometimes it was their version of a rebuke. It's all this mother. And I just sat there the whole time I'm discerning. I let them say what they got to say because the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. 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 They say what they got to say to do what they got to do. And if my spirit said, nope, I look at that person, I smile, and I say, thank you very much, but I did not receive that. And I go on about my business. And so <laughs> we need to develop the boldness to do that because just because we're debunking a lot of what the church has called witchcraft and demonic and all that other type of stuff that is false uh we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater either because there are those that are operating in wrong spirits uh that are speaking and prophesying and preaching things that are in violation of what the most high lays out as holy that are in violation of the torah and the sacred ways of the most high and so the scripture because people, especially in nowadays, people love to over-spiritualize stuff within the body to mm -hmm. the point where, oh, well, I had this vision and I had this dream or whatever, so let me just follow after that. Did you check it out with scripture? Mm -hmm. I don't know who up and thought that with this whole prophetic thing and talking about our spiritual gifts, and I know this. I grew up seeing spirits and feeling energy. I, I got that. I'm, I ain't debunking that at all. But your basis has to be scripture. Your foundation, the bedrock of it all, has to be scripture. Because if it is not, then you've just transferred from being on a rock onto sinking sand, and you can be easily swayed. That's why people can easily join cults and have no problem with it, because their discernment went out the window when the Bible went out the window. So that's, that's what I felt.
in my spirit just in that moment. People need to also have discernment and also continue to study scripture because that is a strong source of your discernment outside of your spiritual gifts is discerning people and discerning the spirit or spirits behind people because not every positive prophecy or word is from the creator and not every what you would perceive negative or just oh well that this that tore me up oh my goodness not everything like that is demonic or evil he corrects those whom he loves so we need to be very hesitant in saying that something that we perceive is a negative word is witchcraft or demonic absolutely again you 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 preaching real good today <laughs> uh what you just said reminds me of uh a, a commonly favorite passage that I've heard preached out of context so many times, um, and that's Jeremiah 29, 11. And everyone loves to loves to use Jeremiah 29, 11 as, you know, as this positive prophecy. And my rebuttal to that and what I uh, encourage when I'm teaching is that uh, please read for context. Uh, everything was, all of these writings were divided up into chapters and verses to help us out. Go a few before that. Um, God, God said through the prophet Jeremiah, get comfortable in captivity. That's what the prophecy was. <laughs> Stay there and raise your children there and do good by that community that where you're in bondage because we don't because we just like the for i know the plans i have for you well part of those plans included 70 some odd years of bondage but we don't like we don't like to hear that we just want a new car and and in a new house um, yeah. we want we want we want prophecies from oprah you get a car and you get a car and, <laughs> <laughs> and not the word of the lord Something else you said, Austin, that that uh, that kind of struck me uh, about you know putting people worshiping rocks. Like you said, never never seen that. I've never seen it. What I do know that Scripture says is that if I don't praise Him, the rocks will. Yes. And then that immediately made me think of when when Moses was commanded to speak to a rock. And he struck it rather than speaking to it. If someone were to speak to a rock today uh, in church, they would be thrown out and and possibly have the rock thrown at them. Whereas Moses himself, the reason part of the reason he didn't get to enter the promised land is because he didn't speak to an inanimate object when he was supposed to. So. See, <laughs> see that that right there, I, the Travis Coward. I'm so sorry. I know y'all want to say something, but look here. This let me let me say this real quick because Job in the book of Job it says, "Speak to the earth, and she will teach you." And yes, the earth is defined as a she, so that connects to First Nations culture when it comes to uh, referring to the earth as our mother, because we literally just as our bodies came forth from the womb of our mother, our body was formed out of the quote unquote dust of the ground, which is the earth. Our bodies came forth from the earth and the ruach, the spirit, the pneuma, the life uh, that came forth from the creator and entered our bodies and gave us life, quote unquote. You can't have the, uh, the living being without the, both the egg and the sperm. Okay, somebody. Um, so it's really deep. And then it, there's there's references to the trees clapping their hands. And then, like you said, uh, if I don't praise him, the rocks will cry out and whatnot. If you wanted to get all sciency with it, we talked we briefly mentioned uh, in the other one about vibration and frequency. When we are not verbally speaking. Noise, if you want to call it that sound is still occurring by everything around us. Everything has energy it is matter it contains energy it is emitting a certain vibration and operating at a certain frequency and when i say frequency i say that because we cannot hear it always that's why you can blow a dog whistle and the dog will freak out and come running and do that but humans can't hear it there are select humans uh if i read the studies correctly 
that can be affected by a dog whistle. Very few because their hearing is just at a certain level and can pick up that frequency, whatever. Um, just like with walkie talkies. If you're not on the same channel, it's not on the same vibrational level or frequency for the walkie talkie right here to go to that one over there and you to actually hear it. You gotta be on the same frequency. So the rocks, they record, as I said earlier about the whole battlefields and why people see apparitions and hear, you know, voices and inanimate um, uh, gunshots and noises and such. It's a record. All of the praises that have been offered up since Adam until now will continue to ring out amidst all creation, even though we cannot hear it. It will continue to ring out so that if we do not pray unto the creator, if we do not sing, if we do not offer worship and praise unto him, the praises of our predecessors, the praises of our ancestors, the prayers of those who came before us will continue to ring in the ears of the creator long after us because they have literally been recorded. Hey, I go preaching again. It has been recorded <laughs> by all of creation. It's been recorded by the rocks and the stones and the dirt and the trees. You know, says the trees of the field will clap their hands. They constantly, when the wind blows, when the ruach blows, the spirit blows, the trees are giving a wave offering unto the creator. So if we, as the most intelligent beings, perceivably, on this planet, <laughs> refuse to honor the one who made us, the trees will continue and they will make up for it. The rocks and the stones will continue and make up for it. So we are calling these things evil and demonic, but they got more sense to praise the most high than we do. I'm going to let that simmer in the pot and I'm going to say Selah because that's all I got to say, but amen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Oh, I had so many things run through my head. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I don't think I think um, you, guys did, you guys did great. <laughs> oh, oh, frequencies and vibrations. Please crap, right? right? Speaking curses. Saw a long form conversation between a former heavy metal punk rocker and a druid. Both come to Christ. And he talked about tuning and how he could create a mosh pit within three chords every time change the whole atmosphere with the sound he put out the druid talked about singing life and singing death into people people were all talking about witchcraft whatever in japan they did a study where they spoke to water and then froze it and every kind of word created a different pattern in the water. Some of them beautiful and some of them gnarled. Just from the words spoken into the water. So the water, like Austin saying, recorded the sound and froze according to the vibration of the sound it heard. So science is catching up with scripture, right? So I kind of want to leave us on, on this note and go probably line us into the next rabbit hole. I'm going to grab my sacred secret stone here and pull up the almighty Google to bring up the voice of a dead man strong. Your quartz and your Colton. <laughs> <laughs> Strong's Concordance in uh, Leviticus 19.26 Do not eat any meat with the blood still in it and do not practice divination or seek omers, omens. Yeah, sorry, can't read my own writing. Oh wait, that's your writing. <laughs> I'll duck later. <laughs> <laughs> that word for seek omens is also translated sometimes as witchcraft, right? So I looked it up. The Strong's is fifty-one seventy-two. The word is nikash, spelled noon. Het Sheen to practice divination and observe signs. Come on, go next. 5173 Nakesh Noon Het Sheen divination or enchantment. 5174 
74. Nikosh. Noon, Chet, Sheen. Copper or bronze. 5175. Nakesh. Noon, Het. Sheen, a serpent. Nakash, Nun Chet Sheen, this name of several non Isir, whatever that is. And that's where it stops. The same spelling for what, four, five different words? And it's connected to divination and omens, copper and bronze and the serpent, which goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Same one. So who is the Nechash? Right, now that's, uh, that we, we, we can run down that rubble hole here in a little bit later on another video. But like we're saying, words have meaning, right? And in translation and in presentation, what's omitted and what's added, Right, like you were talking about Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29 11. We can manipulate scripture, mm -hmm. which gets into witchcraft. Right, so it's the whole council. You cannot separate going back to uh, what Deuteronomy 18 is what we read earlier. Mm -hmm. You cannot separate Torah from Messiah, he is the great prophet that come after Moses that was much greater it, to to say anything other is a form of destruction of God's work that would be a false prophet right a false 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 soothsayer right and this is I don't think there a lot of people are doing it out of malice but they're doing it out of lack of ignorance right my people perish for a lack of knowledge. We don't study to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the word. We don't test the spirits to see if they be of God. We've gone on what one man has claimed good or what one man has claimed bad. Like we talk about the, the nine naughty words in this culture. Where they come from? Well, the F bomb was first uttered by a monk. Now, I'm not going to run, run around saying it all the time because it's derogatory, it's nasty, it's got some very violent connotations to it. But we got to be careful what we call good and what we call evil. I actually have an F-bomb right here. Yeah! <laughs> I keep it on my desk. Oh, is that a sign or what? <laughs> Oh, anything else anybody want to add? Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I'm still weak about the f bomb. Hold on, <laughs> I need to ground myself real quick. I just <laughs> oh, if we if we add anything, we could be here another two hours because because we uh we can go yeah right. I guess I'll just say quickly what you had said the, the all the Hebrew words that you mentioned just the. It, it adds to what the whole topic has been. Who are you communicating with? What is your intention? And what is the source? Because all the definitions you gave of that same word with the same spelling, uh, as far as witchcraft, the bronze and the copper, um, the serpent, so forth, it has to do with intention and it has to do with who you're communicating with and whom you're serving. Because in Genesis, the representation of a serpent is considered deception manipulation or what in a rudimentary term will be evil yet the creator said in order for the people to be healed from the bites of the serpents in the torah they were he commanded uh the elders moses specifically to make the bronze serpent and whoever looked upon it would be healed so there's bronze and serpent at the same time they had to destroy it later because they turned it into an idol and that's a you know a whole nother thing i did a video on tiktok talking about tattoos and that's another subject we're not touching that um, but someone was specifically talking about a biblical tattoo that had a serpent in it because they were talking about, I believe it was Matthew chapter 10, where Messiah says you're to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Uh, in that particular scripture, a serpent, again, is not given as a negative connotation. But usually when we see serpents in dreams or hear it talked about in messages, we think of it in a evil or a demonic terminology. 
uh, as representing evil spirits and whatnot. But that's again where discernment has to come in and who did the vision come from and what is being stated through the vision because just because you see a serpent does not mean it's automatically the devil. Just because you see a scorpion does not automatically mean it's going to be evil based on Luke 10 and 19. Um, so we just, like you said, we have to be real careful what we call evil and what we call good and make sure upon sure that it is the biblical definition and not just, you know, what pastor so-and-so said or what this religion or this belief system says, because we may wind up, uh, we may be going to, with the status quo, but we may very well be going against the, the most high and what he said in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what did you want me to do? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, guys. That was awesome. Shia had to leave us because he had an appointment to be at, but I really appreciate you guys joining us for this. Very interesting. Learned a lot of things. And I just want to reiterate when we have these discussions, that's, that's where it's at, is just throwing things around. And you never know what you're going to learn. You never know. So, um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for coming. And to our viewers, thanks for watching. And we'll see you again next time. Who knows what the next topic will be? Put, put your suggestions in the comments. <laughs>